Hello, my name is Markus Carlsson, and this is the course in Integration Theory held at Lund University. So, uh, by now, all of you uh, already know how to integrate. You've had several courses of it, of integrating one variable and then several variables and change of variable formulas and integration tricks and so yada, yada, yada. So, what is the need for yet another course on integration? I'll first answer that question, then introduce the course literature, and then get to the more slightly technical details. This is a very technical course. So let's first understand why we need all of that. So in mathematics, we're usually concerned with solving some sort of equation, right? Equations, uh, you know, that most people are familiar with is of this form. Right, the second order equation where the unknown is a uh, number. So this, uh, you, know, you know how to solve this one, I'm not gonna do it. But equations can be more complicated like differential equations, partial differential equations. Um, and these are much more common for, for real applications. So we're often interested not in finding a number which is the outcome of this equation, but a function, right? So we solve something that looks like L of F equals to zero, where L is some sort of operator. So if we can solve this equation system right away, then there's nothing left to say. I mean, then you solved it, but most of the time we cannot. That is why mathematics, or that's when it gets uh, uh, interesting. So what is F here? It could be anything describing the physical reality around us usually, right? Um, so I worked a lot with seismic imaging, then it would be the density of the interior of the earth. You're looking for pockets where you can find something valuable. Um, or like with these synchrotrons, take a mice, give him some, some medicine we don't wanna to give to ourselves yet. And then you want to see what happened inside the mouth. So you put them in front of the, this uh, monochromatic, it's like an X-ray. Let's call it X-ray, synchrotron light. Spin them around and you measure something on the screen behind. So what you want to reconstruct then is the, um, the, the density of the mouth inside. So you can look at the structure of Whatever. Okay, so th these are functions that we could be interested in. So usually we cannot solve a problem exactly, but we can do some approximative argument and come up with an approximate solution. So let's say we cannot solve this, but we can find the function f1 such that this is uh, okay, usually it's not a number, but let's just say it's a number, okay? And then we find a function f2, which is even better solution. So, so you get a sequence of functions that are better and better uh, approximate solutions, okay? So then the question is, I mean, intuitively, If you take some sort of limit process here, then you would get the solution to your original problem. So, you know, F1 could be this, something that looks smooth out, and then F2 maybe has a bit more details to it, and F3, uh, this is hard to paint, but you get the point. And each level, you can see more and more details of the function, you get more and more discontinuous behavior. So then the question is, does limit fn as n goes to infinity exist? Because if it does, then we can say that that's our solution to the original problem. Now here, all right, so integration then, if you deal with functions, with a physical uh, meaning, you, you need to be able to integrate them. Um, the integral, if it, you integrate the 
mass density of the mouse, you get the weight of the mouse. Maybe not too interesting, but you still want to be able to do it, right? Uh, or usually in physics, if you integrate uh, some, some sort of energy, you integrate, you get energy, or in probability, you integrate and you want the integral to be one if it's a probability density function and so on. So we need to be able to integrate the functions we work with. Now, the problem with the Riemann integral is that if you start out with very nice integrable functions and, and do this process, you have no guarantee that this limit, this limit might exist in an intuitive sense, so like point-wise or so. Yet this function you so obtain, uh, it's not integrable. And then, you know, the, then the whole thing falls apart. So what sort of functions would not be integrable? Well, the standard example is um, this one. So let's take f of x equals to the characteristic function of the irrational numbers. So Q is the rational numbers, R is all real numbers. And this is set minus, so then you get all the irrational numbers. This is the Greek letter chi, we will use it a lot. It means one if you're inside this set and zero outside. So this is so this is equal to one if x is minus q and zero x. So a bit of an artificial function, but uh, it's a function we can kind of see that it would arise as the limit of this process. So after all the rational numbers, they're countable. Yeah, so, okay, let's ask ourselves, what's the integral between zero and one, f of x, dx? What should it be? All right, so the reason why there's now some white uh, stuff there that just popped up in your video is because I explained something, it didn't turn out very well, so I had to restart, and uh, I guess, and then I cut the two together with my editing program. Um, so I bet that's not the last time that happened. But anyways, okay, so what should uh, this be, the integral here between zero and one of this function? Well, so this function f can arise as the limit of such a process, right? Because if, if q n, n going from one to infinity, is an enumeration of the rational numbers, so q1 could be a third, q2, a half, q3, a quarter, whatever, and so on. So it's possible, that's a basic fact. Um, I'm not going to explain why, but you can count like that all the rational numbers. Um, then we can define, so let this be the rationals, okay? And then we can define a function f n to be equal to the function, uh, let's say, um, 1 minus the rational function of q j j go from one to n of x okay so this is just a function um i'm gonna reuse here otherwise i ran out of space so if f zero is just a constant function one then f one is going to have a dip at q one f two is going to have a dip at q one and at q two so it goes down to zero okay so as long as these are just finitely many, since the integral of the function one between zero and one is one, uh, it should be pretty uh, easy to agree on that the integral of this fn between zero and one dx will be equal to one. 
And clearly, if I do the limit of this process, I'm getting this function, yeah? So if we want any sort of order here, this integral needs to be the limit of the integrals of these guys. So we get the answer one. So these type of formulas are crucial for us to work as to be able to work as mathematicians that you can take the limit from inside of the integral and put it outside of the integral. Problem is that this this already here we break down with the Riemann integral because this is not a Riemann integrable function. All right, so what is now the problem then with the Riemann integral. Well, I'll explain. When we integrate a function, let's say this is our f between zero and one for concreteness, we think of this as the area under the graph. Now, of course, this is a number which we can't really get to um, directly. What is the only thing we actually know how to measure the area of? It is rectangles. So we understand the size of rectangles, yeah? What is a rectangle? It is something that has a base and a height, which I'm going to call M. Usually we call it H, but I'm calling it M. So the area is equal to the base times the height. Okay, so armed with this knowledge, how can we say something about what is this area? So the basic idea is very simple. We chop this up in a large number of smaller intervals, the interval between zero and one. I just do three to keep things a bit simple. And then in each interval, we look uh, what's the infimum of the function in that interval. So here I would take out this section and look for the infimum, well, the infimum is this lowest value here. Similarly, the infimum in this section would be this value over there. And then I make rectangles out of that. Here's the infimum in the third section. So I get this rectangle. So the height here, I can call it M1. This height, I can call it M2. And this height here, I can call it M3. And of course, this has a base, B1, B2, and B3. So now I can compute the area of these three rectangles, right? And in more general, if you have more uh, partitions, I'm going to stop at uh, N instead of 3. So total number is going to be big N. And that is uh, in this example three. So, okay, maybe I even use the same color to write the sum. So, how do I sum up these three? Well, using formal mathematical language, we use this sign for the sum. N goes from one to big N. And then I, for each value of small n, I take the height, which is mn, and I multiply that with the base. Bn and I sum up. Now, this is the area of these three guys for this particular choice. And this number is then clearly less than what I want to be my integral. So let me use the integral notation, although uh, we still haven't really defined it, but this is at least what I want. Yeah. And similarly, we can play the same game. It's just that instead of taking infimum, we take the supremum. And then we're getting rectangles uh, with the same base, but with a new height. OK? So this would now be the height here would be m1. The height here would be m2. And the height here would be m three. Okay.
So these are natural identities we want for the area under the graph. Now Riemann's idea was, well, let's do all types of possible partitionings. We consider all of them. And then you do the supremum of this number here for all possible partitioning. So all partitions. My handwriting isn't the best, but okay. So then that should still be less than this, right? Which should be smaller than here if I do the infimum. So I look for the, you know, the finer we make the partition, the more snug this is going to fit. Yeah. So in the limit, you kind of want the same number here. So you do the infimum of this number, the red one. Again, all partitionings. And Riemann's idea was to say that, well, if this number and this number is the same, then the function is integrable, and I'm going to call that number integral of f. So I define this guy here as the common infimum supremum of these two objects that we can uh, compute, at least in theory. All right, so let's see how this would work out for our basic example of the function, the function which is one on the Irrationals, let me just stick to the interval zero to one. Yeah, so this function already here, this is, despite this being a fairly simple function, it's hard to paint it, right? So it would be, it's mainly one, but it has a lot of, of zeros. So it, uh, I don't know, you cannot paint it, it goes up and down all the time, but it's much more up than down. So if we do our um, approximations from below, well, anytime I take a partitioning, no matter how small it is, the infimum is going to give me zero. And in the next interval, I'm going to get zero, and, and here I'm going to get zero. Whereas the supremum, well, by the same token, it's going to be one and one and one for my three intervals. So if I sum up this, I get one times the base, and I sum up all the bases, so I just get one. Whereas on the left hand side, I get zero. So the supremum, sorry, the infimum here, this number is always one. Infimum will then be one. This number is always zero. So the supremum here will be zero. They don't match up. And, um, and yeah, then the function is not integrable. But this is a dirt simple function, yeah? We can even write this if we call the interval a to be equal real the interval between zero and one the minus the rational numbers then this function f is just equal to the characteristic function of a so in a way it's a bit like a rectangle it's just that the base is not it's not an interval, but something more complicated. Now, so in this example here, what's the problem with the Riemann integral? Is it the way we use these sums at all? Is it the way we think about area like base times height? Or, or, or where is the problem? The problem is that the partitionings, yeah? So when we split the function up in fine, 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 small intervals, we're still dealing with intervals. And that's just way too simple, simple, yeah? To be able to get anything more intricate. So here we have the characteristic function of a set. If we think of how, how should we define the integral now of the characteristic function of A, dx, well, it should be, one, because that's the height of it, times the size of A. So the problem 
with the Riemann integral is not really the integral in itself. It is the fact that we can't give a meaningful number yet to the size of, of uh, complicated sets. So this is why this book that we're going to use by Donald L. Cohn is called Measure Theory. Because before, to, to get to some better integral, we need to learn how to measure things, the size of a set. So then you think, all right, so once we have learned how to measure the size of any set, we're good to go. Well, here's a problem. Obviously, that's what, what scientists in the 19th century or mathematician wanted. And then there's this guy, Banach, uh, and, and a colleague of his, Tarski, that figured out that it's impossible to measure any kind of set. So there's the banach tarski paradox, which says that you can take a P, disassemble it into a finite amount of pieces, reassemble them. So you're allowed to move them, rigid motion, move and rotate. You reassemble them and you get the sum. Now this is just, it's impossible to get, wrap your hands, head around it. But, but actually, uh, and it's in the appendix here, you can read about it for yourself if you're curious. So you can do this with virtually any two sets in R3, so space around us. Um, take the first set, call it A, disassemble it into a finite amount of pieces, move them around and reassemble them so you get the set B. This is just mind blowing. But it means that, of course, a P, and the sun, they have different size. So if we want to measure size in any way that has a physical uh, counterpart or that follows any sort of laws of intuition, we have to exclude sets. So this is why the measure theory course, or before we learn to integrate, we need to measure sizes of things, sets, but then we have to figure out which sets can be measured. So that's why the first chapter here is called Sigma Algebras, um, because those are collections of sets that we can uh, measure. Okay, so okay, so that was the introduction part to this uh, course. Now the course book that we will use is this one, Donald L. Cohn Measure Theory. The good part about this book, uh, I had it as a student, I really loved it. It's very thorough, it goes through all the details and the proofs are very uh, streamlined, thought through, it's accurate, exact, it's like a, a wet dream if you're a math nerd. Uh, the downside of it is that it has virtually no connections to reality. So examples are a bit dull exercises are a bit dull and, and I mean it just starts off with this topic of sigma algebra with a very short introduction um, not really explaining you why you need sigma algebra um, it has improved in later years so the last chapter actually now is about probability theory and it has some uh, more interesting stuff but um, another book which I strongly recommend to have on the side is this one, Elias Stein and Rami Shakarachi, called Real Analysis. So Elias Stein is a very famous mathematician and he did many contributions to Fourier analysis, for example. By the way, Fourier analysis is probably, before I get here to the, um, explain more about this book. So one more example of how do we end up with this problem of having functions that we can't measure. Fourier analysis is a gold mine of examples, right? So what is Fourier analysis? Well, you have some function f, and then you figure out and you can write it, and you probably did this in some course already. Right? If this is the interval from zero to two pi, then you can write it like this. Here should be f of x. You can compute something called the Fourier coefficients, and then you get back your function, but by summing from minus infinity to plus infinity, these uh, complex exponential functions, which are in reality just cosines and sines. 
Now, this you have probably seen before, but then, then you start with a function which is integrable, nice, Riemann works fine. You compute some coefficients and, and you get back your functions. But you can easily flip this coin around, right? If I give you a bunch of coefficients, what function do I get? Now we're back to where I started this lecture. We have a sequence of functions. Of course, they are continuous. Yeah, because it's just a sum of cosines and sines with various frequency. But when you take the limit and goes to infinity, you can actually basically represent any imaginable function reasonable with uh, within this way. So, so it's uh, it's also fascinating in itself that you can get very discontinuous things as limits of very continuous things. Um, Okay, so Rami, sorry, Elias Stein, he wrote a series of four books. Uh, he's now retired, he's very old. And according to himself, this is what like a PhD student in mathematics uh, should know, like the basics. So the good thing about the book is it has, it's full of examples and you know connections with reality and extremely difficult problems. Um, so it's fun. The bad thing is that since he wrote four books, they're all kind of interconnected. And this is a course in integration theory. We have to stick to integration theory. And here it just goes in and out. I mean, here, these functions are orthogonal to each other. If you think of Hilbert space theory, if you heard of that, and many problems in integration theory can be effectively solved using Hilbert space theory or functional analysis. Um, Korn's book doesn't do that, and he does it. So, so I mean, to use this as a lecture notes would, would be impossible because that would be like running functional analysis and Fourier analysis and integration theory in parallel. But uh, as a source of enlightening examples and, and, and good exercises, it's great. So I strongly recommend it as a side reading. Uh, also the continuation called functional analysis has uh, topics which are very relevant. So, okay, uh, another example of where very discontinuous functions are needed is uh, probability theory. And there, if you wanna understand things like uh, our particle moves in a gas, for example, this is called Brownian motion. And then that leads to some really heavy integration theory slash functional analysis. So he does that in, in part four here. And also actually it's in Kohn's one of the one of the additional, he added a chapter 10 on, on probability theory where, where he's also talking of Brownian motion. So in the continuation course, I hope to go through that. That's the plan right now at least. Um, so if, for those of you <laughs> hang in there, uh, there's some interesting stuff in the end of this course. The beginning of this course, however, is uh, dry. Because this, uh, this whole thing of which sets can be measured in sigma algebras, it's, um, it takes a long time before we get to something interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's a heavy machinery we have to yeah, flow through, so to speak, before the, it, the course gets exciting. So, so yeah, uh, I'll turn off the camera now and and we'll get to work in the next video. Thank you for watching.